Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for attending this talk. Um, and let's start. So this talk is based on uh, a research that was co-ordered by myself, by Ras Wisa, by Professor Yuval Alovich, and by Dr. Boris Zadov. Uh, this work was done at uh, Ben Gurion University of the Negev. And this is the agenda for today. We will start with a small introduction. We will then review the background, the needed background to understand the attack. We will review the threat model. We will see some interesting experiments that we did in the analysis. We will then discuss on how to recover speech from optical measurements. We will see and hear, hopefully, um, nice uh, speech recoveries from various devices. And we will end up with takeaways uh, discuss the limitations, and hopefully we have some time for Q&A. Okay, so let's start with a question, and what do you know regarding the picture presented on the right side of the screen? Okay, so here are a few interesting facts. The first fact is that, uh, as you can see, it is a picture of an eagle. And uh, another fact is that this picture was given as a gift to the United States ambassador to the Soviet, to the Soviet Union at the end of World War II. They actually received it as a gift from the Soviets. And it looks very nice uh, if you observe it from the outside, but if, if you uh, examine it uh, internally, you will find that uh, it contained a concealed passive device, uh, which is considered the predecessor of the RFID technology. Uh, which was used for speech eavesdropping. And it was the first known covert listening device that utilized passive techniques. And it took the Americans about six years to determine its real purpose. And maybe some of you are more familiar with its name. Uh, it was named the Great Seal Bug, or maybe more commonly known as the Thing. Now, just before we will, uh, I will ask you another question. I want you to have a look on the picture on the right side of the screen. Um, as you can see, these are a very interesting type of objects. They're all passive, unaltered, shiny, and lightweight. And you can see that there is uh, an, em uh, an empty uh, beverage can, uh, a regular smartphone stand, and several uh, desktop ornaments that usually are placed on desktop for decoration. And here is a question for you. Can eavesdroppers exploit these type of objects, which are passive, unaltered, shiny, and lightweight, as optical implants for the purpose of uh, speech eavesdropping? Now, I will start with the short answer. So the answer, the short answer to this question is yes, and throughout this talk, I will try to show you how, how exactly. And just to give you, uh, uh, just for you to see, this is an example for the type of objects that we are speaking of. Okay, again, a passive, shiny, and lightweight objects that reflect light. And throughout this talk, we name this type of objects as uh, uh, little seal bugs. Okay, they are lightweight shiny objects which reflect uh, light. And <clears throat> let's review the needed background before we will dive into the understanding the nature of the attack. And for doing so, I will let us to continue from here. Thank you, Ben. Hi, everyone. I will take it from here. So first of all, according to Wikipedia, Eavesdropping is the act of secretly recovering sound from a target or a victim without his or her consent. So there are two main ways to apply sound eavesdropping. The first of them is tempest attacks. Tempest attacks are methods that rely on a leakage from a device and require to obtain data using a dedicated sensor and exploit the correlation between sound possessed by the device and the device's leakage. The main disadvantage of such attacks, tempest attacks, is that they are limited at recovering speech only from virtual meetings. The second type of attack is um, side channel attacks. Side channel attacks 
are methods that exploit lightweight objects as vibrating diaphragms and require to obtain data using a dedicated sensor and exploit the correlation between the movement of the object and the sound played near them. But what's different here is that side channel attacks can be used to recover sound both from physical conversation and uh, virtual conversations. The little seal bug attack is an additional implementation of a, si of a side channel attack that, expl that, e that exploits lightweight objects as their efforts. And now we'll discuss some eavesdropping related research. So first of all, in, rec in recent years, the scientific community has suggested various ways to recover sound. Um, we're gonna divide those ways into two categories. So the first, categories is, the first category is internal methods, and the second category is external methods. We're gonna first discuss internal methods. So internal methods are methods that rely on data obtained by a device located in proximity to the victim. In other words, in the same room with the victim. Um, in recent years, we've seen scientists exploit mo motion sensors, speakers, vibration, sensor, vibration sensors, which are all integrated into smartphones, um, to eavesdrop on sound using data obtained from them. In addition, some scientists have exploited data obtained from a magnetic hard drive to recover on sound, to eavesdrop on sound, on speech. Um, if I have to summarize these internal methods, I will say that the main advantage um, is that they are permissionless, which means applications that implement these methods do not require any permission to obtain data from the devices. However, these methods are, um, their, their biggest disadvantage is that they require the attacker to place a compromised device near the victim to obtain the data required. Now, we're gonna discuss the external methods. External methods are methods that rely on, on data obtained by device that is, locate, that is not located near the, the victim. So the most uh, famous external method that we know today is um, the laser microphone, which uses a laser transceiver to recover sound by directing a laser on an object and analyzing the object response to the sound. Laser microphones' um, biggest advantages is that first of all, it's external, and which means it does not require any to place any malware near the victim. And second of all, second of all, it can be applied in real time. However, this method is active, which means the laser can, the laser beam can be detected by the victim if he just uses uh, any dedicated optical sensor. The next method we are gonna we are gonna discuss is the visual microphone. The visual microphone is an attack that was suggested by a group of scientists in MIT eight years ago. And this group actually suggested that they can use a high frequency video camera to recover sound by analyzing the object's response to sound. They show that they can analyze the vibrations on a bag of chips to recover the sound play near this bag of chips. So this method's greatest, greatest advantages is that first of all, again, it's external and it's passive, making it's actually harder for uh, victims to detect this attack because of its passiveness. Um, however, this method cannot be applied in real time because it requires a lot of uh, computational resources to reconstruct just a few seconds of sound. The next and last method we're gonna discuss now in this section is Lamphone, which uses a photodiode to recover so sound, and, uh, sound by analyzing a light bulb's vibration in response to the sound. In this method, we can see that uh, it has more advantages compared to the other, because first of all, again, it's, ex it's external, it's passive, and this time it can be applied in real time, which makes it fast and easy to recover sound after obtaining the data required. However, lamp phones require an uncommon object in the victim's room, which may not be there. So in general, if I have to summarize this whole section of, uh, of uh, related work, I will say that each of the methods or attacks that I have shown you today is limited by one of the following aspects. Some of them relies on remotely controlled device, which makes the, the eavesdropper must compromise the device near the victim. Some of them are active, which makes it easier to the victim to detect the, the use of the method. Some of them cannot be applied in real time, which makes it 
uh, harder, much harder to obtain the data after, to recover the sound after obtaining the data. And some of them relies on an uncommon, uncommon object in the victim's room. Um, so that's it with the related work. And let's move to the little seal bug threat model. So first of all, in the little big, in the little seal bug threat model, we assume that the victim makes the call or attends a meeting from an office or a room that contains a little seal bug um, in the form of a lightweight shiny object. Second, we assume that the sound that from the victim's conversa conversation hits the surface of the object and creates fluctuations on it. And the object is obviously a lightweight shiny object that is placed on the desk in the room. In addition, we assume that there is an eavesdropper. The eavesdropper di directs a photodiode at the lightweight shiny object via a telescope. The optical signal is sampled from the photodiode via an A to D. After that, an algorithm is used to recover the acoustic signal from the optical signal. And um, if we want to summarize the advantages and advantages of the little seal bug attack in comparison to the other attacks I've shown you today, we can see that first of all, it's external, it's passive, it can be applied in real time, and in addition, it's based on, unco on more commonly used objects. Now, I'm gonna let Ben analyze the physical phenomenon of that associated with the little seal bug attack. Okay, thank you. So let's review the needed uh, um, science behind how to uh, basically and why uh, the attack actually works. So first of all, we did, uh, I want to convince you that any lightweight object that you take uh, is actually vibrates according to the sound played near, uh, near, near it. And in order to do so, we conducted an experiment where we took a shiny weight, okay, about 50 grams, and we connected the weight to a gyroscope uh, that was also connected to a Raspberry Pi 3. You can see it on the right side. The Raspberry Pi was used to obtain data from the gyroscope. Now, we play the frequency scan uh, in the spectrum of uh, 200 hertz to 1500 hertz uh, from the speakers, uh, which were placed about 10 centimeters from the weight at a volume level of a 75 dB. And here you can see a spectrogram that was extracted from the measurements of the gyroscope. Now, for those of you uh, who can uh, um, probably it's easier for you to see the frequency scan and locate it and uh, see it uh, inside this, uh, in the spectrum. And this is actually proves that lightweight objects uh, vibrate according to the sound played near them. Okay, now let's understand how this thing can actually be captured optically. And in order to do so, we conducted an additional experiment. Uh, we directed a telescope at the weight, you can see the telescope on the left side. Now we mounted the photodiode to the telescope, okay? Um, and use an A to D to sample the photodiode, to sample the optical signal. Now we play the, again, a frequency scan um, between 100 hertz to 20, to, uh, to 12, uh, to, 2000, to 2000 hertz via the speakers. Uh, which were placed about 10 centimeters from the, uh, from the weight, again, at the sound level of 75 dB. And we obtained the optical measurements uh, in three experimental setups. In the first experimental setup, uh, we didn't change anything. Uh, basically, lights in the room were on. In the second experimental setup, uh, the weights were covered with a black uh, tape. And in the third experimental setup, we uh, turned off the light, and as you can see, uh, no light was in the room. Nothing can be seen from the telescope. Okay, now let's see the results. Um, based on the measurements that were obtained from each of these three uh, experiments, we computed the signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, now as you can see, uh, the sound that was played near the weight can be recovered uh, from the experiment that was conducted, that was conducted when the lights were on, and the weight uh, actually wasn't covered in a black tape. Okay, you can see how the signal-to-noise ratio is positive. This is 
uh, the picture in the middle. However, as you can, uh, this is actually corresponds to a risk for uh, a speech eavesdropping. Okay, you can recover sound that is played near uh, near an object. However, as you can also see, the risk of speech of uh, speech recovery to a subject exists only if the lights in the room are on and the nearby object uh, reflects light. If one of these uh, conditions isn't satisfied, sound cannot be recovered, and you can see how there is a zero signal-to-noise ratio in the two additional experiments that were conducted when the lights were off and when the weight was covered uh, in black tape. Now, let's try to understand how to isolate the sound from the optical signal. And we actually recover uh, speech from the optical measurements using the following steps. First, we filter side effects. Um, the optical signal, even if you will sample it uh, without any uh, you know, a sound uh, near uh, an object, uh, consists of various uh, side effects that we want to, uh, to filter out. Uh, for example, you can see uh, how harmonics of 100 hertz appear in the spectrum of uh, the optical signal, uh, which is, uh, by the way, the result of the way that uh, the bulb is working. So we actually filter these frequencies, undesired frequencies, or undesired side effects with uh, using uh, bandstop filters. Next, we normalize the signal. Uh, normalizing is a technique which is uh, used in the area of, uh, 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 of speech uh, in order to enhance the speech in the signal, and we normalize the signal to the range of minus one and one, and you can see at the bottom the effect of normalizing the signal. And we also uh, apply some uh, noise reduction techniques. Um, there are various ways to, uh, and various noise reduction techniques that can be used. Uh, we actually use spectral subtraction. Uh, spectral subtraction is an adaptive technique that is used to denoise uh, um, single channel speech. And the primary advantage of this uh, technique is the fact that it uh, doesn't rely on any prior knowledge or it doesn't make any assumptions uh, regarding the distribution of the measurements regarding the distribution of the noise. And finally, we also use an equalizer. Um, we use an equalizer to balance between the response of the frequencies. Um, in some cases, uh, there's a weak response. In some cases, there is a good response. An equalizer is used to balance between the responses of the components of the frequencies of the signal. Okay, now let's uh, go to uh, and see the evaluation. And First of all, I want to show you the experimental setup that was used for, uh, for uh, the next experiments that you're about to see. We actually used the telescope, as you can see on the left side. Again, we mounted a photodiode to the telescope. The telescope was directed to these uh, five nice objects that you can see on uh, the bottom of the screen. There is a smartphone stand, there is an empty beverage can, um, and there are, there are two, um, desktop ornaments, and as you can see, there is a shiny Rubik's Cube. Now, um, the first demonstration that you are about to see, um, we play two sine waves, which uh, basically were 280 and 380 hertz, from the speakers, one sine wave at each time, and I wanna show you how it looks like in our, the script that we wrote in real time. Now, in the left side, you can see the script that we wrote, and you're about to see how peaks appear exactly in 280 hertz and 380 hertz. Okay, you can see how the peaks are actually changing between 280 and 380. Okay, so as you all know, uh, the distance from recovering a single sine wave to speech uh, is quite high. Um, is quite long, and I want to show you some recoveries of the speech that we made. Now, we actually compared the results of the little seal bug to uh, two known uh, methods. 
The first method is the visual microphone. And we evaluated the little seal bug attack under the same experimental setup uh, of visual microphone. Now, Raz mentioned at the beginning uh, the research of, uh, that, uh, that was named the visual microphone. Um, the visual microphone was presented about eight years ago by a group of researchers from MIT. And they demonstrated speech recovery by analyzing the vibrations of a bag of chips using a very high frequency video camera, okay? A camera that able to produce more than two thousandths of frames per uh, second. And we actually replicated the experimental setup used in the visual microphone, um, and we did it as follows. Uh, we placed the speakers on a dedicated stand five centimeters from various shiny objects, the objects that they showed you at the beginning, and we played the same six sentences from Timit repository, which was used also by the guys uh, that uh, presented the visual microphone. In this case, we used the same amount of volume that they used, uh, which is corresponds to 95 dB. 95 dB is very high. It is much more than the, uh, the, the volume that I'm currently speaking. It corresponds to screaming. And we placed the eavesdropping equipment about uh, two and a half meters from the lightweight reflective object. Now, um, as you can see in here, uh, these are the spectrograms that were obtained from the original sentence and that were obtained from the optical measurements that were obtained from the various uh, objects that were used uh, for this experiment. And as you can see, the quality of the original uh, sentence um, is at much higher quality than, uh, than, the, uh, than the recoveries. However, I want to prove to you that the signals that were recovered by the little seal bug attack are at very good uh, quality, so you'll be able to hear them. So I'm about to play to you the, the signals uh, in order to, uh, to present them to you. Bear in mind that at the beginning, you will hear the original signal, and afterwards, you will, see the, uh, you will hear the uh, uh, recoveries from various devices. She had your dark suit and greasy wash water all year. Okay, so bear in mind, this was recovered from optical measurements, basically from light. Um, the next thing that I want to show you is uh, an additional recovery, which is very interesting, in my opinion. Um, the next sentence, or the next recovery, was done uh, by analyzing light reflected from Venetian blinds. Okay, hopefully you, you were able to hear it. And take into account that Venetian blinds are basically a piece of equipment that is intended to increase a subject's privacy. However, since they uh, share the same characteristics of being lightweight and shiny, they can be exploited to recover speech from a subject. Okay, basically uh, risking the privacy of a subject rather than increasing the, the privacy of a subject. Now, interestingly, the little seal bug attack is capable of recovering speech in real time at the same quality of, uh, as a visual microphone. Um, it is highly depends on uh, the object that is being used to recover speech. But as you can see, the, the speech recovery is at very high uh, quality where you can hear it and understand what is being said. Now, um, the main disadvantage of uh, the previous uh, experiment that we did was that the fact that it's not exactly practical because the, the entire experimental setup was done at 95 dB at a range which corresponds to about five centimeters from uh, between the object and the speaker. So uh, in order to compare the results of the little seal bug to uh, uh, another attack that is somehow more re in, in, with more reasonable experimental setup and more reasonable threat model, uh, we decided to compare uh, the results or basically the performance of the little seal bug attack to Lemphon. 
uh, and we evaluated the leader seal bug attack under the same experimental setup that was used in Lemphon. And a quick reminder regarding Lemphon. Uh, Lemphon was presented in Blackhead 2020 by, uh, by me, uh, by our group basically, um, two years ago. And we demonstrated speech recovery by analyzing the vibrations of a hanging light bulb using a photodiode. Okay, so again, we replicated the same experimental setup used uh, in Lemphon study uh, as follows. We place the equipment, basically the telescope uh, and the photodiode at various distances. You can see that the distances in this case, um, they rise between 15, 25, and 35 meters. And the speakers were placed at a distance of 25 centimeters from the reflective objects. Okay, now please take into account that a standard desk depth is about 60 centimeters. So basically, we are, you are about to see a demonstration or recoveries that were made when um, the objects were placed at about half of the depth from the speaker, okay? Which is 25 centimeters. Uh, and we played a statement made by former President Donald Trump uh, via the speakers. Uh, in this case, uh, we played it at the volume level of a virtual meeting, which is about 75 dB. And here you can see the, uh, the, spectral, the spectrograms that were obtained from the original uh, statement and the recovered statement, uh, in this case, from the Rubik's Cube. You are about to hear it. Uh, you can see how the, uh, you can even spot it in the uh, spectrograms how the quality uh, decreases with distance. Okay, the, it is uh, this, the, the quality of the signal at 15 meters is better than the quality of the signal at 35 meters. But again, I would I would like to show you that uh, um, the signals that are recovered using the little seal bug attack uh, are perceptible, and you can hear and understand what is being said. So again, you will hear the original uh, sentence and then the recoveries from 15 meters, 25 meters, and 35 meters when uh, the distance between the object and the speakers was, was about 25 centimeters. We will make America great again. We will make America great again. We Okay, so uh, as you can understand uh, and uh, basically can hear the sentences, uh, you can understand what is being said by, uh, and you can identify the speaker as well. Um, let's review the limitations of the attack. Now, the little seal bug attack required the attacker to be uh, located in a physical radius of proximity from the victim. Okay, 35 meters is considered a remote attack, but it's not exactly an over the internet attack. Okay, it's not a virtual attack where you can apply from uh, another state. Also, um, the attack is not exactly uh, easy to apply. It requires some understanding in DSP, and I would say that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the standard 16 years old uh, hacker probably won't be able to apply the attack from an end to end. Also, the quality of the recovered speech is proportional to the quality of the equipment used. And when I uh, refer to the equipment, I refer to the A to D, to the telescope and the photodiode that are used to sample the optical signal. Um, it goes like this. If you will spend more money on the equipment, uh, you, in, uh, you, will, you will be able to produce speech or recoveries at a higher quality. Um, this is a limitation. However, bear in mind that probably uh, resources or money uh, is not a limitation or is not a real limitation for the parties that might apply this type of attack. Now, finally, uh, light deteriorates with distance, um, which basically means that this attack has some physical limitation, uh, which affected by various factors. Um, 
and this is it. Now let's review the takeaways for this talk. Now the primary takeaway that I want you to take from this talk is that despite the fact that this attack can be used to eavesdrop speech, you should be more concerned, in my opinion, about methods to eavesdrop speech via uh, IoT devices with an integrated microphone. And uh, for example, a smartphone, a laptop, an IP camera, uh, and a smartwatch are probably uh, more risky in terms of privacy uh, than these devices or these objects, which are, again, it requires some understanding on how to even apply this type of attacks while um, in many cases, these devices are much, are very easy to, uh, to compromise. Um, moreover, as you can understand, many shiny lightweight objects can serve as optical implants that can be exploited by eavesdroppers to recover speech. In some cases, this is comp they are completely innocent um, objects like desktop ornaments or a, a smartphone stand or an empty beverage can. Uh, and in some cases, these are objects which intended for the opposite uh, purpose to increase uh, a, pri a user's uh, privacy like uh, Venetian blinds. Um, all of these devices, due to the fact that they share the same characteristics being lightweight and shiny uh, can turn into optical implants when there is a sufficient amount of light in the room. Um, also, interestingly, the area of optical speech eavesdropping has advanced significantly in the last eight years, um, ever since visual microphones have presented a method to recover speech using a video camera. Uh, Four additional attacks uh, were presented in the wild, most of them in the last two years. Um, the first one is Lamphone, where uh, demonstrated the ability to recover speech, again, using a photodiode by analyzing the vibration of a hanging light bulb to nearby sound. The second is LiDAR phone, which demonstrated how uh, a robotic vacuum, a, a robotic, uh, um, a RoboVac, basically LiDARs, can be uh, exploited to classify isolated words. And an additional attack that was presented last year was the Gloom attack, uh, which have demonstrated how um, speech can be recovered from power LEDs of speakers, again, using a photodiode by analyzing the intensity of the power LEDs of the speakers. And the last attack was presented today, which is the little Silbag attack, where again, photodiode was used to recover speech. And we expect that more optical eavesdropping methods that rely on optical sensors uh, will be demonstrated in the next uh, few years. And also, there are three interesting facts that I want you to think of or to take into account. First of all, photo detectors are integrated into, I would say, all of the smartphones uh, nowadays. Uh, each and every one of you um, have a smartphone with an integrated photo detector. Moreover, smartphone manufacturers continue to increase the sampling rate of the integrated sensors. In some Android devices, uh, the sampling rate is currently around 500 hertz. Okay, and bear in mind, it continue to, uh, 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 the manufacturers continue to increase the sampling rate over the years. And here is another interesting fact, which is obtaining data from the photo detector doesn't even require a user's permission because it doesn't consider as a risky data which is associated with a risk to the privacy. Now, all of these uh, facts alone aren't very important or maybe aren't even risky. But combining these uh, three facts together, uh, we might see an implementation of a new type of malware and compromised applications for speech eavesdropping via a smartphone's light sensor in the near future. And again, bear in mind, currently your smartphones uh, consist of a photo detector. They allow the su a sufficient um, sampling rate or probably gonna allow a su more sufficient sampling rate in the next few years. And also uh, obtaining this data doesn't even require to declare about it in the manifest 
of the, of the Android application. And with that in mind, I would like to thank you for attending this talk. Uh, you can find more details uh, related to this talk in uh, this website. And we will take questions from the audience. Thank you. We have a question from our virtual audience. So the question goes, how would one detect if such a device is being used for eavesdropping? Okay, so this is a problem because unlike a laser microphone, which is an active device, uh, this is completely passive technique, which doesn't even utilize an active sensor uh, in order to recover speech. So. Um, the best answer that I have is to use a video camera and to scan for a photo detector, for a, for a photo diode. Uh, however, again, due to the fact that this is passive, it is very unlikely to, even, to find um, a disguised photo diode within, uh, you know, the, the range of, uh, of the attack. Um, hi, Daniel Grusier. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's very nice. I have a question on the last takeaway. So the last takeaway was uh, that you could mount this on a mobile phone. Have you already looked at the software side of this? So what um, fr from the software interface level really is, is possible there, even if the sensor gives you 500 hertz, whether you actually get that on the okay, software level? Okay, so uh, honestly speaking, I haven't tested whether this attack Mm -hmm. can be applied on the smartphone. I do, however, read several papers that recovered speech from uh, accelerometers and gyroscope. And the first uh, paper or the first study that was presented and recovered speech back in 2014 at Usenix, uh, they used about 200 hertz or 250 hertz, something like this, to recover speech. And if you will see the next studies that appeared after this uh, study, um, the greatest, I would say, progress that they made was due to the fact that the sampling rate was increased over the years. Now, I played a lot with Android. I didn't uh, test what exactly can be done with the photo detector. Bear in mind that we use a more professional photo diode than the photo detector that is currently uh, with the much less error, with more sensitive, you know, to capture various things. I didn't capture it. I didn't uh, try it. I do believe that if the sensor is good enough, that we are about to, you know, to, to see a different, a, a new type of malware I haven't seen before. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.